Hey, this is Huck. If you want to watch this top three asshole keep doing esports content, subscribe to Thorin's YouTube channel. Okay, this is episode 11 of Watch the Overture. Usual host and co-host Thorin and Yiska here. And our guest for this episode is going to be Harsha, who was a former coach slash employee of the San Francisco Shock during the period when they were building up to become a really good org that they're going to try and be this season. So we'll see if that indeed has worked out. Now, this topic that we wanted to discuss for this one, Harsha, was one that I think is a very interesting one, because what I think's made the Overwatch League unique is that it has been quite artificial. You know, you started with the buy-in league immediately. That was, in theory, the real start of Overwatch. I know we had a bunch of tournaments as nerds that we all enjoyed, but that's kind of like reset. And as a result, by the way, I noticed in all the awards shows around the world, like Profit and fucking, you know, like... <laughs> These players are up for like rookie of the year award, which already made me like, I started having like fucking aneurysm and blood was coming out my nose. Like trying like, <laughs> like screaming at people in rooms and stuff. And they were like, I don't know what you, what was that? Some sort of like prequel to Overwatch League? Like, yeah, you were bloody hell. But anyway, so I forget in that world in which there was a history before, it meant that people came in with massive budgets and you saw all these different approaches to roster building. You had pretty much every one you could get. You had the people who were like, right, just get the best Korean team. Does that work? You had the people who were like, right, get the most popular Western team. Did that work? Get a team and just get all the mixed players from Europe that you think are good that no one rates. Does that work? Get a team and get all the players that are the most coachable but underrated. Does that work? It's like, what I, what I love was we saw all these approaches because quite frankly, and this is the topic we're going to talk about in roster building, there is no perfect approach. No one's got the blueprint right now and in fact as i think we found during the year overwatch as a game even had some sort of idiosyncrasies to how the roles work in the meta swaps that you never could have had the perfect blueprint like even if you'd have picked the right one at day one i don't know if it would have held until the end and so some of it was adaptation so let's start with the basics in this sense harsher so one of the topics i thought we could begin with was the sort of nationality or the background of the players you're bringing in so coming into the league, I would have been very cynical. I mean, people know my position on this one. I would have just said, just get the best Korean players. Like, let someone else try and figure out how to get, like, NV players and FaZe players and mix them with some rookie who was on Luminos. Like, if that guy wants to do that, God bless him if he makes it work. But I'd just go ahead and say, get fucking Gesture and Profit and these other players who you know are good already and then try and make a team like that. So what, what do you think in terms of the whole league? Why, why were there so many different approaches to roster building, do you think? I think obviously marketing has to do with it. So like it will be way easier to market teams that are, uh, that have Western players or like at least some Western players. But also I think that, I don't think that you, you can just like sit down and say, you know, Koreans will, are the best and will always be the best. I think that there's like a larger concentration of, you know, top players in Korea. And so it's the easy way to kind of build a full Korean roster or just take one that was, you know, really good in apex. But I think that there are a lot of coaches in the in the scene, um, you know, myself included to some extent, that think you can make like a, a West, I mean, a, a mixed roster rather, where you take the best from a bunch of different scenes and um, presumably like work out the communication issues before the season or, you know, at the beginning of the season and then come up with a better product down the road that's, you know, marketable and uh, has really good players. Okay. Right, what do you think on that, Yiska? Because obviously most people did do this approach is like most people went the mixed route. Like you got the people who could buy an entire squad from Korea, okay. But aside from that, most people, like I noticed, I made this point myself in a video, it was called like Koreans carry the Overwatch League, where the point I tried to make to people is, it's kind of <coughs> mad because even the teams were called in Western teams, most of them, one of the best <laughs> players on the team would be a Korean carrying the fuck out right. of them at like some key positions. So like mixed roster does seem like the way people want to go. Yes, and to a degree, I mean, there was some success certainly th this season with that format, right? And I do think that it has some advantages certainly in, in terms of marketing, but I mean, there has to be some, especially European talent, two NA players, by the way, only in playoffs, I think, um, <laughs> <laughs> naturally. Um, but yeah, generally, it's also a problem a little bit that Unless you pick a full Korean roster, I think what we will run into is a problem of re resupplying these top t tier talents, right? When you already have like a full Korean roster set up, 
because it does look like, and also what Wolf said on the last overture, it doesn't look like that well is going to run dry anytime soon. Right. So the adaptation of new talent is going to be much easier in, in, in the future. Now, the thing is, the, the problem is, even with the formula, if you have an idea how good your formula was in the first season, now the some components of the formula are entirely being changed. For instance, like if you're going for a late peak in the season, suddenly that's possible because of these play-in tournaments, right? So you don't necessarily have to be one of the top six teams. It's enough to be the 12th best team, which is not even an average team. It's a slightly below average team. And um, in that way, if you can then just, you know, build your team towards a later peak or even substitute players during the mid-season signing window, that, that opens so many new possibilities for your team to do well. So I think that the formula is not even like tentatively figured out at this point. I, I think I understand what you mean by building for a later peak, but I think that the game is so like volatile in terms of patching that in order to like in order to kind of build towards that you need to have a certain type of player like you need to have very flexible players mm. my idea would basically be i hold my budget back to the mid-season signings yeah. i look at what the meta will be looking like and I, I mean it's significantly more likely that my season f uh, stage four meta looks like my stage three meta or like late stage two, depending on what the signing window will be. So I have a much better idea what kind of talent I want. There is a possibility that top tier talent is still in for an off off pick hero or something, something where I then can allocate more resources than other teams that are fighting from with me for these spots. And I get an advantage there, even though that might be a little bit of a dodgy um, situation because once again it's at the end of stage two or it, it was doesn't necessarily have to be that way by the way for uh, the next season and even if they just extend it to like mid stage three that is already much more feasible then yeah that's also one of the problems I see with like Overwatch because there's no sport that exists like this. In no in no sport are you predicting the meta of the sport, and more importantly, the meta is not going to change during one season. Like in the NBA, or the NFL, yeah, if you go over like a five or ten year span, the meta of how like the most successful teams play and succeed and what the captains are that will change, but it won't change during the one season after you've already set your roster. Like it's not going to suddenly all of a sudden like your style doesn't work at all. Well, because that's the case, I feel feel like either we have to ignore that and everyone just build their strongest roster for today and then just ride the fucking the winds of fate and if fate takes you to the title you win and you look like a genius and if it takes you to the bottom <coughs> you did your best it wasn't your fault you got a bad run of the die because if you're going to try and actually build your roster to mitigate the the meta changes you can't do any of the things people have bragged about with the season one rosters so the two factors everyone kept going on about was that we'll have substitutes so that you can like truly court the players so if this player can't do his job we sub him out and in comes a player who can do his job well if we're trying to mitigate for the meta we can't have two players who play the same exact role we're wasting a spot there so then you've got a scenario where you're gonna have to have specialists if you have specialists now you're in a world where you don't use them the best example to me okay was snillo because if this yeah. was a different eSport game, the story would be like this. Like, wow, they brought in this rookie. He's looking really fucking good. He's doing a great job at his role. He's obviously like a Tracer main. Like, he's looking so sick. What's his future? Well, there's no future. Tracer went out the meta. He went out the team and he never heard from this guy again. Like, you could have actually believed he wasn't on that team at that point in time. Like, that's how outrageous the swap was. So either you keep him and he's like a meta sort of insurance. Like, if ever we get like that type of DPS player that we need, he's on our bench, but he's not doing anything in the meantime time or you have a true player who's going to compete with carpe etc for the carpe's role and that's how you're going to keep carpe at the top so for me it's like i don't see how you can since there's only so many spots there's only 12 spots on a roster i don't see how you can make both of those work and then the other angle is monty always tried to blow up that storyline of like because he because he comes from korean league of legends where this was the way you practiced right. you have a sister team you practice internally with them on the really important shit you do some practice with other teams but in doing so all of your like secret stuff can never get leaked because your sister team won't 
leak it. Well, what sister team can you have if all of my sobs are like the fucking John Crap player and the Tracer <laughs> player and the Mercy player? And at the moment we're playing where it's like Brigitte and you know what I mean? Like it's like that. There's no sister team there. Like that that wouldn't even work as an internal scrim. So like I, I'm not saying I have the answer for this because what I'm kind of saying is you got to make a choice. You got to pick which one of those you think is the approach. And I don't actually know what the approach is. I feel like it, it's probably should be a blend of both. But then how do you do both? Yeah. I, I think the issue is that like during last season, teams that had the full rosters weren't even consistent with the internal scrim. So like nobody really knows if that actually is a like a good solution. Um, you know, maybe it's helpful at the end of the year for Fusion where, you know, they have one team to scrim, whereas London maybe doesn't have a team to scrim because everybody else is off. But throughout There's the season... There's also a problem with that as well, mate, which is that the only place it's worked historically is Korea. And I don't know what the Koreans specifically do or, you know, how they make it work. Like, I'm, like it's one of those things where I don't know if a Western team can just copy it unless you knew yeah. what they were trying to do with it, because I'm not sure. Usually, as far as I can tell, some of it's not even like real scrimming. I think it really is like specific setups of like you use them. Basically, you use them as though they were like, amazing bots that do exactly what you want in the game to, to test run something as far as I can tell. For Shock when we did internal scrims, which we didn't do like very frequently and it was only just parts of stage four, there would be times where we'd ask our, you know, the B roster to do specific things so that the A roster could practice against it because you know what opponent you're going to be playing and kind of what strategies they'll run. So even if it's not the B roster's um, specialty, you need them to run certain things to get you prepared. Yeah, and the, the problem I see is that even if you get your 12 players together, I wonder, for instance, in Valiant's case, just how quali how high the quality yeah. of those scrim actually were. Because, okay, it, it's probably not fair to say this in that way because there were some roster change-ups, but when players from that B team came in and played against the Shanghai Dragons, they were belted out of the arena against them, right? Like, I wonder how good the practice actually can be then against your B team, right? So, I mean, it, it, there's also certainly a problem of budget. Are you going to get, like, the nuts player on your, on your B team, right? Like, now, obviously, th there's a there's a, an incentive with the academy team, especially with the two-way players um, coming in. And I wonder if you're probably not better, like, su served by having your academy team or your um, or even other academy teams scrim with you in that regard. But the other issue with with that, like if you get a star player on your B team, they're not going to be happy not starting. So, it, yes, I think there are just a lot of issues with uh, trying to go that you know go that route in general. That's also, by the way, a reason why I would suggest it works for Koreans and it doesn't in the West. Like Koreans, yeah. like you wouldn't believe if you if you're a League of Legends fan, the number of times you'd hear a story about a player who was like a sob who's amazing on a top team and he's not starting, but it's never entering his brain. Like ask for a transfer to some lesser squad. Like in his mind, he first of all he believes all the bullshit of like if I try hard enough, they'll let me in the main team. And then secondly, in his mind, it's like the family environment of like, well, I'm in this team now, so I'm loyal, right? I'm I'm not going to leave this team so like again with western players good luck making that work i mean you've even seen actually this is something we saw in League of legends is when koreans go to western teams all that culture stuff drops real quick all of a sudden they're a star player and it's like hey well it's time, if i'm going to be in some fucking western team i better get all the money and i better get all things my way you know and all that like politeness you have to realize that's like socially enforced it's like you need a, you need a certain critical mass of koreans and a coach before that all like takes over at that point in time Speaking of which, though, another approach people have taken to building rosters, Harsha, is get Korean coaches. Like, I think at this yeah. point in time, almost every team in the league has at least one Korean coach. What do you think on this aspect? Because clearly, there's something that Koreans have in all games, as far as I can tell, breaking things down. But we've also seen teams that haven't necessarily benefited from having this. So, just from interacting with them, like... I'm not sure what it is that that kind of makes it so that Korean coaches are so um, highly valued, but like I'd say there's a, a clear big three, right? So there's uh, Pavon from NYXL, Krusty from obviously Shock and Boston, and then uh, Moon from Valiant. All three are very different people, yet they're all like very respected by the team. Um, at, at least to some degree, have very good game knowledge, and like they they also all just have like the respect of their their entire team, right? So I don't know really what it is that binds them. Uh, maybe it's just because they, um, on, I, I don't know. I really want to propose like an idea, but there's, there's so different people that like, it's hard to kind of suggest anything. Um, I will say that I think that every team 
has somebody in, in staff that's Korean or a Korean coach or whatever it is, just because every team is getting Korean. So, you know, sure. you need to make them feel comfortable, yes. um, make sure somebody can coach them. But otherwise, like, it's hard to really say what it is that binds them just because I know that a lot of people would talk about kind of the Korean mentality and um, how they respect their coaches so much and how their coaches enforce that, that vision on the team. But I don't think everybody's necessarily like that, but they all still uh, seem to be at least good coaches. Hmm. What do you think to the angle? Like, Jeske, you know, you have that theory. I forget how you phrased it, where it's like about how the core of a team is built up and like you can't just instantly make a new one. Right? If you look at the teams that did very well in the Overwatch League, so like, I'm not counting the Philadelphia Fusion as like top elite team because they made mm. the finals or whatever. Like that was just they had a playoff run. So the NYXL is obviously the number one team in the league over the year, right? They clearly did have a core going back to the LW Blue days, and even though some of them won LW Red. Then you look and you look at the London Spitfire. They also had a core. Basically, what they did in the end is just end up with the core of like the fucking. KDBP players and then add in some of the others like they kind of did go that approach so some of the cores did endure in the league and have success right do you think that getting a whole team initially is like the best initial approach because sure there were teams like Fusion that it was piecemeal they just put together a whole bunch of players Boston also did the same thing and ended up being good at certain times like what do you think on the because it's clearly a different approach to take like getting a whole core in as opposed to building a team from scratch yeah. So one thing that um, I found with my uh, theory was that I underestimated just how much time there is to actually build these cores. And that allowed, for instance, a team like the Boston Uprising to just, you know, form a core of four and then, you know, substitute accordingly. I also think that the problem, for instance, that Krusty had towards the end in shock is that he came in and they sort of there wasn't too much switching, but certainly Moth came in and whatever. Like these, th that was under the time frame that is usually allocated for building new uh, cores. And that's also, that explains if, if the core is also sort of a way, an expression of the coach's mentality in the game, then this core started as soon as Krusty joined the yeah. team. And then naturally that would make them even though we consider Cressy a better coach likely than um, than Brad, that would just make it so that he has a sort of semi-reset progress towards building a core four, right? So now, in order to substantiate that theory, I think we would have to look at the next season and if Shock can bring it back up to speed. And I certainly think, for instance, that they picked up a couple of great like pieces that they were missing and... I then have to say they are probably a playoff team at this point, right? From yep. the information that we have. So, um, in terms of just picking up cores, I think there is a certain amount of value in that, unless you are actually a builder of core mentality. If you can actually, if you actually have an idea what kind of Overwatch you want to play, and now the te season is uh. far out for like four months. Like you probably have time to rebuild a core. I will say that all of the coaches I, I named earlier that I called the big three have very specific like ideas of how to play Overwatch in mind. So, for instance, Krusty is like a very aggressive coach. Like he likes um, certain roles to take leadership and always wants to be like looking for the next play to be made. Whereas, just my opinion and from what like we saw of NYXL and Valiant, it seems like Moon and Pavan are more structured in the sense that they want to be more like reactive and they um, they feel like more defensive teams. So I think that uh, having somebody that, that has a very uh, strong will, like, or rather has a strong will uh, and, and enforces that in the game could be something that binds all these like strong Korean coaches together. Because another thing that flows seemingly from the coach and their philosophy on the game is how we're going to set up things within the team, like who is the shot yeah. caller, who is the leader. And one of the things I've noticed in that area is it's the same as in every esports game I followed that's a team game. You have people who, I hate to use the term naturally do this because like there's nothing natural about learning a game and picking a role and being fucking amazing at it. Like it's all hard work. But there's people who seem to just like have an aptitude for that role. And as I've found in every esports 
sports game. Go and look in Dota 2. It's no exaggeration. The most successful players in the history of the international in Dota 2 are the captains. It's not the fucking star players, believe it or not. You can take those star players and put them on different teams and they go up and they go down seemingly willy-nilly. Meanwhile, you get those like legendary captains, the Puppies, Jawit, the PPD. Those guys are continually making top eight, top six, top four at the international again and again and again because like those extra leadership qualities along with shot calling are so like worth their weight in gold somehow they just translate so i've noticed one of the reasons why we had this amazing drama with uh, uh fisher was because this is a guy who clearly has tapped into some of that and has like some mad ability to shot call that just quite frankly isn't in the league. There's very few players have that. And so he really can be a talismanic player who goes wherever he goes, you feel like that's going to go with him. Whereas I know a lot of the teams were doing what I've seen in most of these team esports games, which is they think of it as a role you just pick and learn. Yeah. So they tell someone, right, your job is you're going to learn to shot call. And at that point, you know what? Some people will make it through the filter. Some will become good. The amount of them that will become truly great, like the people I'm referencing before, probably very few. And unfortunately, the risk of trying to pick someone and have them come up, so much of your franchise is going to then rest on that guy managing. And so some people aren't going to make it. So as someone from inside the coaching world, inside the scene, as we've been all learning these lessons in season one, what do you think on this topic? Because I saw a lot of teams use a lot of different approaches in this respect. I would definitely agree, but I'm... I don't know what what you would call like the right answer necessarily, right? I'm not sure like, there is one. Yeah, I think I think that it depends on the coach, and it, you know, it can vary for sure. Um, and and you know, just to that extent, we saw NYXL being historically strong throughout all of Overwatch League. Like they never looked like a weak team throughout any of the stages. Although maybe you could debate they didn't look that great during stage four, but they still, sure. you know, they still got second during the stage playoffs, right? And were probably the third best team during that stage, but. And then all of a sudden, you know, that collapses with the next meta and they don't look very strong at all. And I don't think that's just because they had that one week or the however long the break was because, you know, they got a playoff by. I think that um, during during that playoffs meta, their their structure wasn't necessarily um, best for it. And you saw like looser teams, I think, take advantage of that and become the two better teams during uh, playoffs. So I think that. Um, it, it's really hard to kind of describe, but I feel like there is uh, something to be said about having a structure and and making sure that that um, your team flows throughout that. But also being too rigid with it can also come with disadvantages, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the typical example would probably be something like uh, Fissure, who is who seems to be sort of like if we're thinking of Wizard Young's ideology of uh, Overwatch to be, you know, per playing perfect Overwatch and like running these comms that aren't specifically like absolutely meta, but can work if you're p executing very well. Fissure is none of that. Fissure is like the hammer just just drives into your opponent and tries to exploit the um, the setup gap, right? So in in that regard, Fissure for instance, demanded a lot of resource and whatever. I think, for instance, someone like him would probably not work like with someone like uh, Krusty in that regard. So um, it's certainly interesting how these different approaches led to different types of success over the season. W one being, of course, like one has to objectively say that NYXL just had a better approach, a better understanding of uh, yeah. perfect Overwatch. Um, while Fissure definitely... Like, I don't think you can make Gladiators a team better this quickly than the way Fisher did. I think if if you bring in, for instance, Wizard Young to Gladiators, he then has to learn, or they, the players have to learn that playstyle for more than three stages, and it's over. Their, their season's over at that point. I think that there's something to be said about the way, uh, so the role that Fisher plays, right? He's main tank, um, and dictates i think the main thing dicta uh, dictates a lot of the strategy in the sense that you have people like gesture who play um gesture and muma who play maybe more passively but also like they're they're flanking a lot uh, require less resources in a sense and fisher who you know is jumping from main every time being a very vocal leader for the team so i think that if you're looking for a quick fix i think players like like fisher are, are actually really good in the sense that they provide leadership 
and then uh, they make sure that it's very easy to follow for for everybody on the team. Whereas their players, I would I would actually consider Gesture a better player, but he's not he's not a quick fix to a team. He is he's part of like a different system in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, another example, obviously, would be the dreaded Voldemort-esque dream Casper, because <laughs> sure, that team kept it running for a while after he was gone. Yeah. And they, and they, I mean, a lot of those wins, sure, were like skin of their teeth type stuff. Yeah. But they never fully recovered from not having a player like that. Because again, not only yeah. was he a star player, but clearly was like, uh, impacted your style and your strengths as a team. So it was almost like a cultural leader in a weird way. It's actually crazy how how unfortunate Boston's situation was because first of all they lose him and he's like the vocal leader of the team and then right after so the next stage um, Tracer's out of the meta and and Striker has to learn a bunch of different heroes now so and they then kind the of just leaves anyway so yeah it's it. true yeah <laughs> yeah that's got to be one of the what ifs right. <laughs> what about this then so. One of the, if we extrapolate forwards, the reason why the whole like bring over a whole roster approach seems so good, and I will say, I think that this is a topic where like anyone who's going to say like, well, wait a minute, Saul Dynasty had a whole roster. It's like first of all, they didn't. They had a very different roster to Luke Kai, like fundamentally so. Mm. So I don't even think you can rely upon the strengths there. Like if they'd have really brought over Esker and people like that and tried to make that work, and then it had have failed, I think that'd be a very different story. Secondly, you've got the aspect of like people like Envious probably already were going to have those same problems anyway. That wasn't really anything to do with like yeah. the roster. And, and if anything, they showed at the end that when they cut out some of the problems, the roster could actually succeed. So like when you talk about bringing over these whole rosters, I think generally it has shown itself to be a quality move if it was a very good team. So the team everyone's obviously been looking towards is a team who could have been in the Overwatch League anyway, which is Runaway, who now apparently have all signed and we're going to get to see them in the Overwatch League. So can this team be like a test case can this like prove out what we're talking about well i personally think that runaway is a sort of special case not only okay so the the lunatic high situation was actually very different than what runaway is coming in into the league because lunatic high actually looked qu quite underwhelming in, uh, yeah. in season four of apex right they didn't come in as a champions or even like if you play that best of uh, 100 series against these teams, they're not making it to the finals anytime, right? Miro looked already very exploitable at this time. Then you add on to this that obviously Anna and Lucio weren't meta during the Overwatch League. Obviously, you were always going to have these problems. Now with Runaway, the interesting part is is that much of the core, uh, ma namely Bumper, Stitch, and Huxal, these guys have maintained a certain level over the seasons they've they've ha played three finals now these guys right so it's interesting that they seem to have that bounce back ability within them now the yeah. question for us is where does that bounce back ability come from is that maybe the culture of the team it, it, can you maintain that when runner is not with them right or flowering um or is it actually something innate about the players? Is it maybe something that their picks came back into meta? Not as much, I would say. I think they, especially Huxa played a bunch of uh, stuff over the seasons. Even Stitch um, sort of worked quite well then later on on Widow. So even though those don't look like star players at this point, I wonder if there is they, if the bounce back ability of that roster comes from the remaining players, then I think at the very least, even if you have an underwhelming regular season, they are one of those teams that definitely could bounce back into these play-in tournaments. And then also, depending on what the meta is, or if they figure it out or whatever, could actually like make a deep playoff run. If anything, I think historically they've had to, you know, now that Dive has kind of been phased out of, uh, of the meta, they've had to adapt to new metas and have done so fairly well, I would say, just from their results. So I think, yes, this is probably the test case. Um, in a sense, like, if they do well during Overwatch League next year, it kind of <coughs> proves, I would say, uh, that just buying it, or bringing in a full, like, top team from Korea could just be the answer to to um, winning Overwatch League. And obviously they have, if they come over as a full team, they have eight players, right? So they can supplement four more players, presumably. And so we can also kind of test the theory of, whether uh, bringing in people that are better for late or like later metas uh, to have like a, a later peak in, in the season 
if uh, that works as well. So yeah. I think it's what about two this then? Because I think that leads in, as you said at the end there, to a topic I really wanted to discuss, which is how you use your slots. So you can have 12 players, and obviously you only need six for an Overwatch game. So you can have six people in reserve. Now, if you are a general manager, do you ever want to start the season with all 12 and then try and cut people and replace them? Do you want to start with a certain number and have space to add in because of the meta or a specific sub? What do you think is the, the line on that? I generally don't think you should start with 12 just because so much can happen during a season where, uh, you know, potentially a new hero comes out and nobody on the team has the ability to play it. Well, all of a sudden you're kind of screwed, right? So. And th that's just a, a very um, niche example, I would say. And it's it's being like extra for the sake of it. But I do think that going into the season with all 12 players already picked, well, what if other players develop and all of a sudden you could have had, had them and they made the difference for your team uh, in becoming a playoff team, something like that. I think that like it's very short-sighted to go in with 12 because even though you're at the advantage of having internal scrims early on, it seems like the later in the season or like later in the season means more uh, in terms of playoff hopes. So in general, I think that going in with 12 isn't the best idea. And I think that um, it's, it's a bit short sighted in my opinion. Was there actually a player that came in as a specialist in the later stages and actually created value for their team as a specialist? Mm hmm. I mean, there was the Snillor one, but that's about it. As far yeah. as I can tell. That's the only one I can think of. I mean, Spree sort of... Uh... I'm trying to think of what trades happened. I mean, I guess... Fi does Fisher count? Uh, I guess... Uh, well, no, no. So, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, because I, I'm not sure if that entire thing actually... Like, even if you put someone in a time chamber and he practices doomfist the entire time and just waits for you know something to happen that makes him competitively viable just as an example and it might actually already be the case don't know <laughs> but um like i'm not sure if his ability actually outweighs the you know communication stuff and whatever and i think that's also very role dependent so the the idea of a specialist i'm I'm not sure we've had enough empirical evidence of that actually working out. So that that might be a problematic thing in the future. At the same time, like once again, we're back to roster building. There's it's so hard to determine. Like for instance, let's take the Defran situation, right? I'm almost scared for Atlanta at this point because uh, Soldier is sitting at like. 59% solo queue. He looks very strong. We obviously don't have yeah. any competitive. Um, play currently going on that might actually be the saving grace but it be, because even if he's pretty good at World Cup I'm not sure if that directly triggers nerfs but like if I'm at Atlanta I have the Fran sign at this moment who could legitimately be a top three soldier in the world at this point in time and then he's now a very good hero I'm scared man to th that they nerf him till you know it, it becomes relevant again right so, yeah, I'm not sure if these specialist situations work as well, but at the same time, maybe we didn't just didn't have these scenarios with um, sort of special situations with the meta switches that could realistically very well uh, be the, the case. The only one that really could have applied was Brig, and to be fair, like, mm. it's not a very difficult hero to play. Mm. What about this then? How does someone build a roster to try and be successful in multiple different game modes and with an arbitrary map pool, whereby if your map just isn't in for this match against that team, good luck. If your map just isn't in this round, good luck. Like another reason that's going to be hard to build a roster is like, even if my team's not the best, at least if I have a basis of what we do on this map, I can practice another map as well. Like, you know, from every time you reset with the squad, it feels like it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of sort of like basic information threshold you have to hit with everyone. Just a side rant really quickly, but the way, the way that map pool worked last year was so unbelievably dumb. Like That's the one of the rare that, examples, you know, of where I always say this. I say, like, if, if say a bunch of people in no esports decided stuff, right, maybe you think single, single elimination is better than double elimination. We argue over that, right? 
we're never going to go, let's just make it round robin best of one for the whole thing. Like we, with the difference is we would never, between the two of us, come to a conclusion to do the worst one. That kind of map pool setting was like someone clearly just had like arbitrary power and he made literally one of the worst calls you could ever make in the format. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, where are we going with that? And we st- halted the rant there. Yeah. Was, <laughs> no, I think... I th- oh, did you want to continue a rant on the, on the maps? I mean, it's just a small point, but just imagine that like we had to play Dallas Fuel and all of the tank maps, and they were you know a really good tank team. Whereas you know there are other maps in the pool that are uh, let's say double sniper or whatever it is, and they might yeah. not be as strong. So yeah, but that, yeah. that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I mean that that's certainly and that's probably not going to be better because once again, like if if we're interpreting what we know of the current games, um, it's you're playing your division twice and the opponent division yeah. once. What if you hit, you know, the the guys from the other division in the in that part of the season where they are not strong or whatever? I think there's a lot of variance now uh, with these. I mean, that's how it goes. I think to a degree it's unavoidable, but because of the artificial nature of patches, that's always going to be a problem in Overwatch more so than in, for instance, in other sports where it's like, okay. Maybe you like in the second half of the season you play that one team late and therefore they have a peak at the end and you're um, like disadvantaged by that. Of, of course, that can always happen. My problem is the artificial factor of the patches coming in. So, but back on the topic of how do you build a team, I honestly think once again we have to sort of refer to our friend Taleb. It's it's like you need to build your roster to be anti-fragile. What that means is basically you need to build your roster in a way where when others shit the bed, you are th- right there to benefit from that. I don't necessarily th- even think that if you, let's say, if you want to be a playoff team in the Overwatch League, I think you need to build in a way where you are not hit by patches as hard as the others. Be that... Be, like I don't know what the metrics of that are. Certainly, having a bit of a bigger squad of that could be a thing. Having a lot of redundancy in that regard, also strategical approaches. You probably don't want to be, you know, that one dive team that just plays dive the entire time, like Boston, for instance. And then once dive doesn't work anymore, okay, you're like in that in that way. Boston's run was actually quite fluky because. If you think about it, it, for three stages to have dives, quite fortunate for a team like that. But um, yeah, I think just just to be there when others aren't, like it was the case for London with the NYXL, yeah. I think that's ba- basically the th- best thing you can do with that roster because you have no idea what's happening. The complexity of the situation is completely overwhelming and you just need to have better answers to a shitty situation than anyone else. It's hard to to say anything other than that, just because so much is is um, variable throughout Overwatch League that there's no really good answer in in this like in the sense of building a roster. So I just say, you know, follow a system and have something in place, just because you don't want to just pull good players in for no real reason. But otherwise, um, yeah, anti fragile. Mm-hmm. So one thing we alluded to before and ties into this idea of being like anti fragile is you almost have to build a squad both to be good now and to have some chance in the future of adapting, right? And one of the problems that I've already seen in Overwatch is Overwatch was actually being held up as the best example of an eSport where you could substitute players. Because in Counter-Strike, for example, it was often something people used to spitball, which is like, if I really had enough money, why don't I just have like the best team in Counter-Strike, but then also have a sub who plays like the one map that we're not very good at, who makes us like slightly better at that one map. And then we truly would rule the whole scene, you know, we'd have like the whole map pool. We could, we could flex against any opponent in the game. Now, the real reason why nobody is willing to try that in Counter-Strike is because even though we are featured in the eSport game, which arguably has the best system for that, like you play separate tournaments, your results don't stack one on top of the other in terms of an overall season, and more importantly, you get mad playtime for everyone. Even so, the feeling of Counter-Strike still is that they think that having people play every game and be warmed up and be at like the maximum chemistry level outpaces whatever short-term advantage <coughs> you'd get from that sub or that ability to flex in the... Now, I don't know if that 
that's entirely true because actually what I see in League of Legends Overwatch suggests that maybe you could do it. Like you could actually make it work for you and be more of a benefit. But I can't fault the players. Like there still is something to be said for having that six start in five or six that always has good chemistry, that has been through tough times, that can come back in a game. Like in some ways, I almost feel like that supersedes like the tactical advantage. But I don't know though. Like that's the tough one. It's like, what do you do in that respect? I think part of the problem is that you saw so many teams that had 12 players or, you know, 10 players, eight players, whatever it was that just defaulted to six players just because first of all, chemi I think I do think chemistry is like a realistic concern just because um, there's some roles that you don't want to replace at all. That might be the ones that in this meta. Um, so, so let's say for example, uh, with, you know, he who must not be named dream Casper Boston, that was never going to sub him out, but let's say, um, there was a meta where he wasn't as good on on the heroes that striker and mistakes were the the two best players at right but because the system went through him and he was uh, the kind of in-game leader why would you ever sub him out right mm. so i do think that a lot of teams ended up defaulting to just using their six players or maybe seven or eight uh and just rotating like a specific role and i think that they probably had stronger results because of that because they got there's there's so limited Especially last year when there were two matches a week, there's so limited time to practice in Overwatch. Like, it, you kind of have to make sure that what you're doing, like all the time that you use, is valuable. And so that's why I think that we saw a much more, um, I guess, restrictive system last year. Now, with presumably one match a week or sometimes two matches a week, uh, but you know there are some times where you have one match a week. Maybe there's more time to try out uh, experimentation with like subbing in more players. I think the only team, though, that we saw really successfully uh, swapping in and out players was NYXL, and even then, it was mostly with their DPS and Arc and Animo, not really Janus and uh, Mono. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't. I honestly don't know if that can ever be a thing in Overwatch, because the, the intangibles seem to be so important that... And the component of synergy in those intangibles seem to be so huge that it is actually probably very hard to do over a, a sustainable per period of time. And you probably just need to reinvent that. Now, also, like, there's always the challenge of how do you split practice time? Um, also, like, obviously, how do you keep the egos in check? For instance, I know. During the um, winner's interview, Jackie Chan said that he probably is never, never going to have a 12-man slot uh, team again, if I recall correctly, right? Simply basically alluding to the fact that if you have legitimately two of the best teams pre-Overwatch League in one of your rosters, everyone wants to play, and everyone is probably sort of right in asking to do that, right? Yeah. Because they, they are those great talents that would probably start on other teams, right? So it, it's it's certainly going to be a challenge. At the same time, I'm not sure if that de debate is decided yet because, for instance, Valiant sort of... I, I don't think they even scrimmed that much um, outside, did they? Did you have a lot of scrim blocks against they, them? Yeah, we, had, we scrimmed them a decent amount at least. Okay, so b because I, th I thought they had the facility think, away from the... Yeah, but, but people just... Toward, so the issue is nobody really wanted to scrim off of land, but then towards the end everybody started scrimming off of land, so mm. it wasn't it wasn't okay. really an issue. Okay, yeah. Because you know that actually is another factor that I think might have made the subbing aspect seem cooler than it was in season one, is that because you had such a limited number of teams and you had some players who accepted spots on teams when they should be a starter in the league, yeah. you had, I, I think, actually a, a, a rare time in history where you had people on the bench who were fabulous players, whereas if you go forwards in time, people like Shadowburn aren't just going to chill on your bench, man. They're just going to go and play for someone else. And by the way, be a star player and be like a fucking franchise name that everyone's loving. So once you get so that the subs really are subs, that they're like new players or rookies or like just not good enough to be a starter, now maybe you can sub. And even then, you're probably not going to sub that guy directly for your star player. Like it's probably going to be like other roles that get the sub. So that, that maybe that corrects itself as the league expands. Yeah, I think yeah. the expenditure certainly will trigger that simply because I don't think 
the amount of star level challenge has significantly incre increased during that year. I think there was some, there is some uh, star level talent coming in. For instance, a decay comes to mind. Um, for instance, maybe one underdog pick would be someone like an IV. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure a violet certainly comes to mind, but in general, I don't think it's a ridiculously high percentage that, uh, comes into the Overwatch League and has a legitimate claim to be one of the best players. Now, if you drag them over several teams, like all these players will have spot starting spots. I think it's very hard to... Con if I'm Violet and I want to join an Overwatch League team, I think you will have a very hard time to convince me to join the Spitfire simply because Bedosin is in front of me. Yeah. I'm not convinced that I can get past him. Obviously, it's a baller move if you can, but you're probably not going to be uh, paid as well as he is, or you, you like other teams will certainly have a bigger pay check for you ready. Um, it's it's a hard decision for a player to take. I almost also don't think the the idea of having sort of the the skill of the player that starts ahead of you trickle down onto you and you're sort of like gaining experience or just a di more direct communication way for you to develop the talent. I, I don't think that was true for any of the um, the subs over the season because these star level players don't, simply don't have time for you in that uh, r rigid uh, structure that we have in the Overwatch League. So I'm not sure. I, I think what it do will do though is that Despite the league increasing, the probably the average level of play will even decrease a little bit, but not as much as one would think it would, simply because t talent now disseminates over s several teams. What do you think, Harsha, of the element of what I, I labeled like the Korean creep, where like not only are there more Koreans coming in, but there will always be this like temptation there when you need a Korean or a player to replace someone. Why not just get the best Korean player not in the league right now, basically, and put him in the squad? So one of the big problems is you definitely can make mis mixed rosters work. We saw it happen. But yeah. if you have a mixed roster and you need to replace a player, Again, why not just make him a Korean if the base of the team's Korean? Like, is this actually a real thing? Like, did, do other people, is it an observation people have made? Is it, is it not going to matter? Are people going to stick with pure mixed rosters as they are? What do you think? So it's absolutely like an observation that people have made just in the sense that, well, I mean, you can kind of see, I think from, if you look at the reports, it looks like the, the league has gone from like one third Korean to, you know, one half Korean or whatever it is now. But uh, there is one issue in the sense that if you want a solution mid-season and you're looking for a Korean in a role where communication is highly valued and it, you're a mixed roster, well, you don't want to suddenly change your, your team's language to Korean just to, to uh, situate one Korean sure. player, right? So, Unless you're the outlaws? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, look at, if you look at it as a long-term project, then... Like certainly you could definitely go for the Korean and then teach him English, or if he has a good level of English already, then he can fit right into the team. But if you're looking for like a quick fix, it's not necessarily a Korean player that will always come to mind. Granted, like somebody like Architect, for example, from Shock, was um, he, he had very little English before and and came in as like immediately a factor. But I think that that's specifically because of the role he played, and not necessarily just because he was like a top Korean player, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's actually that's actually quite an interesting development that specifically main supports. One wouldn't think that because main supports aren't flashy and whatever. They seem to be commanding actually quite high prices in the yes. current market simply because some coaches have that mentality of the main support having to do a lot of shot calling. Now, players with the ability to talk both languages like an arc like that, that might be the most valuable player in the Overwatch League right now. He's like very experienced, very skilled. We don't know about his Lucio yet, but uh, and possibly other flex picks because we don't know if if they will have to play Zen or Anna over the season. But still, like just the ability to pr talk quite decent English and then also Korean might be very valuable. And then obviously, the, you would think, for instance, Decay is one of the most attractive players. I'm not sure. It might actually be ARK in that regard if NYXL is uh, willing to part with him. He he does seem like potentially... There's there's nobody you'd rather get as a main support currently. That that's, seems like they aren't going to be on that team, or on their team rather, uh, than ARK. Like he's definitely one of the, the uh, 
top acquisitions you could land during this offseason just because bilingual like being bilingual is so valuable this video was kindly supported by Andreas Snazor Westerland, Dean Tanglis, Gardner Wilson, Landon Thompson, Nate DOGG, Kyla Harris, Travis Greb, James Harding, Daniel Yordanov, Vexi, Robert Baxter, and a special thanks goes out as always to Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Would you like to ask me a question in my monthly AMA? Would you fancy a few teasers for what's coming up in my content? How about taking part in an esports discussion with me? We'll put your money where your mouth is and join the Screluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.